Becoming a member is easy. We require a minimum donation of $120, which can be paid in monthly or quarterly installments, and have tiered donation levels to allow for social, socioeconomic diversity with levels at $120, $300, $600, and $1,200. You can become a member today by donating through the website, allowing you to contribute to the annual focus area and vote for grantees in the year that you donate or by sending a check to the Missoula Community Foundation Office at P.O. Box 8806, Missoula, Montana, 59807. You will also find a community of philanthropic sisters working together to use donations to affect change and learn how to be a more intentional and impactful giver. The reason we're doing this is that this webinar series was con conceived to bring the latest information to our membership and the greater community, presented by local experts in the areas of financial, medical, and social impact. We invite you to join us for summer, all of our summer web webinar series, which is available to our membership and the public without charge, and will be presented during the lunch hour for easy access. Please feel free to share this information as widely as possible. The next webinar will be on July 7th at noon with the title Social and Emotional Impacts of Isolation. Our presenters will be from the Missoula Aging Services and the Tamarack Grief Resource Center. Also during Dr. Ward's talk, please feel free to use the chat feature to send us any questions for us or our speaker. In April 2020, Missoula's unemployment rate was 13.1%, increasing 10 percentage points in the last four months. In order to better understand the impacts of the pandemic on our economy, we've invited Dr. Bryce Ward to talk to us about these impacts and what we might see as the economy opens up. Dr. Ward is the founder of ABJM Consulting and a research associate at the Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities at the University of Montana. He holds a PhD in economics from Harvard University and BA degrees in economics and history from the University of Oregon. He has expertise in many specialized areas of economics, including urban, regional, health, social, real estate, environmental, natural resource economics, and econometrics. He has lectured at Harvard, Lewis and Clark College, the University of Oregon, and Portland State University. He has published do dozens of scholarly articles and reports and has provided expert testimony in court cases and legislative proceedings. His research has been featured in numerous venues, including the New York Times, the Associated Press, PBS NewsHour, NPR, and ProPublica. Dr. Ward, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for the Women's Giving Circle first webinar in our series. Our program manager will keep an eye on questions as they come in, and we'll have some time at the end. Please welcome Dr. Bryce Ward. Thanks, Terry. Uh, let me get my thing up here. Uh, where do you go? I just shared it, and now I don't see it. Um, oh, here it is. There we go. All right, so um, about 100 days ago, I gave my very first COVID economics talk, and I started it with this little uh, GIF here, because uh, that's basically what it felt like uh, back in early to mid-March trying to talk about uh, COVID in the economy, and that, you know, like the Wiley Coyote, you kind of knew something was happening, that the world had kind of shifted underneath you. We didn't really know uh, how big the impact was going to be and how far we were going to fall. And um, the good news is that we at least are learning about how far we've fallen. Um, so we're no longer kind of at the running through the air knowing that we're going to fall stage. We're at the having fallen and starting to try and figure out uh, how to climb back out stage, which uh, I guess is a better stage to be in, although the fall has been, uh, the hit and the fall have been pretty hard. Um, so, um, Here's some data um, that kind of gives you the overall flavor of what's happened in the economy. So this is consumption data based on credit card spending um, uh, from a website called Track the Recovery. And basically you can see that, you know, kind of in January and February, there's kind of at this pretty stable level. Uh, it fell off a cliff, it kind of bottomed out in early April, and then started climbing out about the time the stimulus payments went out in mid-April. 
Um, and then it kind of, that kind of launched it up and then it's kind of been, eh, you know, maybe trickling up a little bit uh, in the weeks and months since then. Now, obviously that's overall spending. You know, if you look at different types of stuff, uh, spending has changed, you know, in different areas in a lot of different ways. And this is actually, this is a little bit older data, but you can see that as of, you know, late April, basically, you know, people had stopped going to barbers and beauty shops altogether. Uh, airlines, they'd stopped flying on. Restaurants and eating places were way down. Uh, but they were putting in swimming pools and still landscapes, landscaping their houses. And just this morning, um, you know, some, some of my former colleagues put out a paper which, uh, shows which shows the breakdown in spending by the income of the neighborhood and it shows that there's a very large disparity uh and that um the, the the spending decline is heavily concentrated in the top quartile of zip codes that were by income um you know so their their spending as of a few weeks ago was down almost 20 percent still whereas in the in the bottom 25 percent of zip codes spending was down only 25 or only five percent you know, if you look at this slightly differently, um, as about a week ago, those high income zip codes were spending about $1.4 billion a day less than a year ago, whereas uh, the lower income neighborhoods were spending only about $130 million less. And so when you're looking at the aggregate decline as of about a week ago, over half of the spending decline is concentrated in high income neighborhoods. And this has important implications um, for how we understand what's going on in the economy and, you know, and understand what we're gonna do going forward. So first, this tells us that this recession is very different than the Great Recession, right? So in the Great Recession, if you looked at the decline in consumption, it was almost entirely concentrated in durables and non-durables. Whereas in this recession, the decline in, in consumption is two thirds in services, which were largely unaffected. Um, by the Great Recession. So um, it's a very different recession. And as this has two implications. So first, this, is, this kind of confirms what economists have been saying throughout this whole time, which is that fear of the, of the virus is what's driving economic conditions, right? People are afraid of the virus, and as such, they avoid face-to-face -face services. At more affluent, people are more likely to consume those or spend more of their income in those services. So we're seeing a big decrease in economic activity related to face-to-face um, -face services. Um, so that's the bad news. The good news, I guess, is that you know they're not spending their money. Uh, the personal savings rate in April, which is the last month we have data, data rose to 33%. Now, you know, in recent months, it had been slightly below 8%. So that's about a, an eight time or four times increase in the amount of money that people are saving. Um, so, you know, when things get better, hopefully, uh, people will still have a lot of money left to go out and spend, and that should help uh, us recover uh, once we beat the virus. Uh, the second implication of this is that it really does suggest that economic policy has significantly mitigated the potential negative impacts of lost income, particularly among the low income. And I didn't put it in the slides, but the same paper basically shows that, you know, the week that uh, the the twelve hundred dollars stimulus payments went out. Um, spending amongst the low in the low income areas jumped substantially, um, you know, and you know on the day that the checks arrived. So uh, so that suggests very much that you know that particular stimulus program, but then the other stimulus programs uh, have have certainly managed to mitigate some of the consumption impacts amongst our lower income people who are typically the most vulnerable. Let's look at Montana data a little more specifically. And this is that overall consumption data again. And just kind of for reference, I've put in two other big states, California and Texas. And Montana is the blue line here. Um, and you can see that, you know, kind of follow that same general pattern that we saw for the nation, kind of dips down, bottom out in mid-April, rise back. And, you know, they kind of see this kind of more of a plateau than we see nationally. Um, you know, kind of jump back by mid-May, but we haven't really grown much in terms of consumption since then. So we've kind of had this big dip, but we've kind of settled in at maybe what the level that we might expect to see for a while. And that's about 13% decline in overall consumption. Uh, again, there's our, this is restaurant and hotel spending, which remains down 45%. Um, if we look at earnings for workers and small businesses, um, again, we have this more daily data from, you know, it's a subset of small businesses that use a certain app to schedule their hours. 
you know, it kind of follows the same pattern, a little bit more recovery than, than the spending data, less of a plateau, but certainly a decline in the rate and still remains down more than 10%. Um, so what does all this mean? You know, that's just kind of broad economic data, but there's another survey that's going around called the Household Purse Pulse Survey. Some of you may have gotten it in your email. Um, my wife actually got to fill it out. I was very excited. Um, so in Montana, about 41% of households report that they've had at least some income loss since mid-March. 7% um, are reporting that they don't have enough food in the week. 41% uh, are still delaying medical care, or at least have in the last four weeks, which suggests that fear of the virus remains high. And 13.5% are housing insecure, which basically means that they either didn't pay their rent or mortgage last month, or don't think that they'll be able to pay it this month. Um, you know, the good news is that, of course, our levels are generally lower than the, the U.S. overall. So, you know, as just as with the virus, the economic impacts in Montana have been muted, um, but they're still high and they're still not great. So, if we dig into our employment data in Montana a little bit more specifically, unemployment's a little bit confusing right now because. Uh, the way that we measure unemployment is this thing called the current population survey. And um, the questions it asks don't deal well with people who say, hey, I'm not working because of COVID. Um, and so people get sho shoved into a couple different categories. And so what I've did is kind of just abstract away from the unemployment rate and instead just say, well, look, what share of the people who say that they're in the labor force, which is usually the denominator in the unemployment rate, were at work last week. And you can see, we can see this by month, um, and I've compared everything to last year. And you can see the blue line for 2020 kind of falls off a cliff, as we expect in April, um, you know, down 11 percentage points. Uh, but it did jump back in May, kind of consistent with those data that I just showed you. To 86% uh, to of, of our labor force was at work last week, but that's still down nine percentage points from a year ago. So he said, okay, well, who are these people? What, who's, who's missing from work uh, recently? And um, relatively good news is that if we say, okay, what's driving this decline in employment that we see? Almost none of it is due to people who say that they have lost their job permanently and now are now looking for a new job. At least according to the CPS data, the entirety of the change that we see is due to an increase in the share of people who say that they are temporarily unemployed, that is they expect to go back to their job sometime within the next six months, or they're absent from work, um, which is usually capturing people who are out sick or are on vacation, but there's been a, a large spike in that, which we think is likely misclassified temporary unemployment. Um, so we're gonna combine, I've combined that here. And so that's, you know, that is relatively good news in that it suggests that people at least think that their job hasn't permanently disappeared and that they're going to go back to that job. Now, whether what people think is actually likely to happen, um, that's, that's a, remains uncertain. There's, you know, and ultimately there's two parts to whether or not someone who's currently lost their job is likely to end up going back to that job. And there's basically the two parts of what's happening in the economy. So first there's the suppression. Right, this is all the stuff that's directly related to the virus. And when people are no longer afraid of the virus, suppression will end. And, you know, if this were happening in a very short period, we would expect that basically everybody would go back to their old jobs. However, as things go on and as the, you know, the, the actual impacts of the virus ripple through the economy, there's actual stuff breaking in the economy. And that stuff, when stuff breaks in the economy, that's when we tip into a more traditional recession. What we're having with suppression is technically a recession, but you know, I'm gonna use the term recession to capture the stuff that we normally think of as a recession, which is stuff has happened to the economy that we either have to rebuild or transition away from. And so both of these things are going on and to the extent that we see temporary versus permanent job loss will depend on how much of this is just suppression and how much of this is in that more of a recession category because of stuff breaking. So let's take a look at suppression a little bit more in detail. So suppression, as I mentioned earlier, is driven by fear of the virus. You know, the virus is bad. We don't know when we're gonna encounter it, but we know that I'm gonna be more likely to encounter it if I expose myself to more people. Um, 
And so, yeah, let's break that down a little bit. So the virus is bad, people are afraid. So this is excess mortality by week in the US. And so all the little lines uh, that aren't red, those are kind of the last several years. Basically that shows how many people in the US died typically. You can see there's kind of a normal pattern there. There's a little bit of a range, but you know, it kind of is within a, a well-defined range. And the thick red line comes along and that's, that's 2020. And you can see this enormous spike in mortality. Um, and this is across the US and across the US, we've seen about a 25% increase in mortality just uh, this year. Now, if I go to some place where it's been really hard hit like New York City, the increase in S mortality is closer to 300%. So obviously the US is big and some places in the US are like Missoula that haven't really been hit that hard yet. Um, but other places have been hit uh, quite, quite substantially. So the virus kills a lot of people, it maims a lot of people. People don't wanna get this virus, so they're afraid. Now, the problem with virus fear is that it's not a switch. It's not just gonna somehow, you know, at some point it will hopefully go away and then we can turn it off. But in the meantime, we're kind of having to learn how to live with the virus. And that fear basically depends then on the conditions that were present, right? And so instead of thinking about the virus as a switch, we should be thinking about it as a dial. Right, so where are we at in terms of, uh, you know, how afraid of the virus do we think people are given current conditions? That'll tell us a lot about the kind of ec economic activity that we can expect. So ultimately, you know, how much fear exists is a function of three parts, right? Will I encounter an infected person? Will an encounter lead to an infection? And how bad will the infection get? And we can change all three of those variables, right? So starting at the end, to the extent that we develop therapeutics or treatments, um, how bad an infection will get, that changes over time. Um, you know, will, a, will an encounter lead to an infection? Well, I can take steps to reduce that. That's what mask wearing and, and remaining uh, distant and, you know, putting more space between people. Um, uh, that's all what can change those probabilities. And obviously, to the extent that here in Missoula, at least, we have very few infections, to the extent that we can keep people from getting infection, keep other infected people out or isolate the ones that do come here, we can reduce the odds that I'm gonna encounter an infected person. Um, and that also should shape where we think we are on the dial. So as I mentioned, the good news is that in Montana, we, we, the odds of encountering someone with COVID have been low. Uh, unfortunately, those odds have been rising. Um, I guess not unexpected given that we're now in the summer travel season. Um, and given how many cases still exist elsewhere in the United States, which we are still connected to um, and have to deal with. And, you know, unfortunately, we haven't seen the level of decline in new cases that, we, that I think a lot of us expected to see a few months ago. Um, so, you know, the other part, of course, is, you know, will I encounter, you know, what kind of situation will I encounter somebody? And that obviously depends on what I'm doing uh, in the summer, because a lot of what we're going to do is going to be outdoors. Um, the odds of encountering somebody will probably be relatively low, uh, or the odds of transmission uh, will be low. Um, you know, but as we move back into fall and winter and we move more indoors, uh, our risk is going to go up because what we know at this point is that uh, the risk of transmission is much, much higher when you're indoors in close proximity with people and you're either talking loudly, singing, or et cetera. The other thing that's a little bit concerning here in Montana is that, at least thus far, Montanans have been avoiding people less um, and engaging in fewer uh, protective measures like mask wearing and hand washing. Right? So here's a little plot from some data that, you know, from different regions. Um, and you can see Montana's down in the lower left-hand corner being, you know, amongst these regions, having the, 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 the fewest number of people uh, saying that they're avoiding certain people in uh, certain, certain situations, and the few, almost the fewest number of people who say they're wearing masks and hand washing. So if it comes here uh, and we don't change these behaviors, it will likely spread more quickly here than in some of these other places. So the bottom line is that fear remains pretty high. You know, in survey after survey, and I've just picked one here, um, most people or many people are still saying that they are unlikely to do a lot of different types of things. Um, now, it's gotten a little better relative to a month or so ago, um, but, you know, far less than normal uh, shares of people are saying that they will eat at a restaurant, stay at a hotel, go to a mall, fly on an airplane, go to a movie theater, etc. And obviously, when people avoid those activities, economic activity in those sectors and in related sectors 
will remain depressed. So what comes next, right? So this is the general shape of recovery that economists have been talking about. Some call it the swoosh recovery. Uh, my friend who made this graph calls it the ABC re recovery. Um, you know, basically we're, you know, when we've kind of seen a bit of a jump back and we expect a little bit of a jump back relatively quickly as things kind of settled back in. But the question is, is really how long will we go from B to C? And basically, you know, how long will it take us to get back to where we were before all this started? And even perhaps even more importantly, how long will it take us to get back to where we thought we would be um, before all this started? And how long all that takes depends on four things. How long do we have to deal with the fear of the virus? So how long does the health crisis last? How much damage do we do to our capacity um, as we kind of work through that period? And then you know, as we come out of it, how much income will people still have to spend and what will they want to spend it on? So this is the current CBO projection of what's going to happen to GDP. Um, and you know, kind of used to see it following this swoosh pattern. Um, but you'll notice that even at the end of 2021, it shows us a couple of percentage points below where we were at the end of 2019, uh, which puts us you know, substantially below where we thought we were gonna be given that we expected to grow the economy in 2020 and in 2021. So this is, you know, a lot, most economic forecasts suggest that the road to recovery may take a long time. Um, the other thing, of course, we have to worry about is um, you know, the, the, the dreaded second wave. And so this is deaths from the 2020 pandemic laid over the deaths from the 1918 pandemic. You can see that we're kind of following along at the level that we were seeing um, in the 1918 pandemic. The question is, is will we suffer through these big extra spikes um, as we come into winter and spring? Hopefully we will avoid them, but there's nothing that, you know, suggests that they will not occur. Uh, but hopefully we'll be smart enough to figure out how to not let such things happen. But the extent to that which they do happen, that will affect the economy. And of course, the longer it takes us to ultimately contain and beat the virus, the more st likely stuff is to break. And this is from an older survey that come from early in the crisis. But it basically suggests that kind of in the absence of any support programs, you know, it asks a bunch of small businesses, um, how long would you still be alive? Um, and the vast majority of small businesses without assistance cannot survive six months um, of a crisis. So um, either we've got to solve it quickly or we've got to keep providing support uh, because most small businesses can't survive a prolonged crisis. And so to the extent that businesses go out of business, that's when we're going to start having issues with capacity. And that's when we move more into the recession aspects of uh, what's going to happen. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, well, how much capacity are we really destroying? That's the first question. And when economists think about capacity, we think about four forms of capital, physical capital, natural capital, human capital, and social capital. So let's talk about what we think might be happening uh, in these areas. And physical capital, it's the least concerning or the second least natural capital I'm not even going to talk about because it's just kind of nature. And, you know, we're hopefully not destroying it too much right now. Um, but physical capital, yeah, there's some deferred maintenance that's probably not happening. There's some investment that's not happening. Uh, we're certainly gonna have to repurpose capital from businesses that close. And there's certainly capacity that's currently being shifted into fighting the virus that will have to get shifted back. So there will be some uh, frictions created in the economy from repurposing capital and from the lack of investment. But this is probably not the biggest problem that the economy faces uh, related to the recession side, you know, recovering from the the transitions or the damage uh, from COVID. Obviously, a much bigger concern is what we'll call human capital. So human capital is the skills that people possess. Um, so um, when people die or get sick, their skills often die or or, or, or diminished with them. Um, obviously, you know, the students uh, who are having their education interrupted um, are going to be, you know, what we learned from studying previous pandemics is pandemics tend to be bad for uh, human capital, for workers, uh, for long periods of time, uh, particularly those who were students at the time, because their, their learning is interrupted and it's very difficult to make that up. Hopefully we'll be better this time at figuring that out. Um, you know, when a, when a business is, dies also, you know, there's a lot of things that you know about how to operate at that business that you then lose and you have to go and relearn. So that can be inefficient. 
Um, you know, there's some mental health and substance abuse issues that it sounds like maybe you'll be talking about next time that also may be affecting, um, you know, just how productive we can be um, when things go back to quote unquote normal. So the thing that actually has me most concerned um, is what we call social capital. So social capital is a weird concept, but it basically has to do with the productivity of your relationships. So relationships are where information comes from. Uh, it's where favors come from. Um, it allows us, you know, trust with, uh, in trust, working with trusted partners allows us to do things a lot easier than we might otherwise do with them. And so obviously when we're not being social or being social in the way that we normally are, that's being effective, right? And so at the individual level, it's kind of a mixed bag. You know, a lot of us are still finding ways to socialize um, distantly, um, talking with people uh, on Zoom calls or whatever it is. Um, but at the firm level, there's definitely been a loss of social capital. It is very difficult to create and maintain social capital amongst uh, existing workers uh, when they're not interacting face-to-face -to, -face. Um, to the extent that uh, businesses are failing, uh, you know, relationships within the, your business network are failing, um, and those take a long time to rebuild. In fact, we have, you know, giant sectors of companies are, you know, in sales and marketing that are fundamentally about establishing and building relationships uh, in the marketplace. At the community and national level, it's harder to say. Um, obviously, we've, we've added some additional uh, stressors to our, uh, our society that are, you know, on top of COVID. But, you know, ultimately, traditionally, what you see is you kind of see this impact, a honeymoon, a disillusionment, and then this kind of recovery. Um, and, you know, we're seeing a lot of these state phases going on currently. Um, and the question really is, is, you know, how much solidarity can we maintain as a group um, uh, you know, and continue to work together to solve our problems um, and do so in the most efficient manner possible. And this is the thing that obviously, you know, I'm a social capital researcher. Uh, uh, it, it gives me a lot of concern uh, what I'm seeing with social capital in a lot of parts, uh, in a lot of communities. Um, in addition to capacity issues, um, you know, so great, let's imagine that we preserve all the capacity. The other thing we have to worry about is will demand for that capacity exists? And that has two parts. Will people have money to spend? Um, and like I mentioned, it's, thus far, we haven't seen a big income shock. Um, we've kind of supported income. As I mentioned, a lot of people are saving money that they uh, would otherwise be spending. And so the income shock right now currently doesn't appear like it's going to create a ton of headwinds. Obviously, we don't know what that will be by the time the crisis is over. So this could create headwinds if we don't continue to support income. Um, but a lot of people are, are, are concerned, and this is, a, you know, a lot of people have spent a lot of time talking about is, well, not just will they have income, but will they want the same things, i.e., has the pandemic and all this time in isolation changed people's preferences? And there's a lot of speculation on this stuff. Um, and obviously, I'd love to speculate with all the rest of you on what might happen, but the reality is we just don't know. Um, what this does do is it means that our uncertainty, our level of uncertainty is higher than it normally is. And so to the extent that we're trying to understand or think about or make plans about what's going to come in the future, we have to expect that uh, the range of possibilities is wider than it normally is. Uh, maybe this will be the time when things fundamentally change in some key way. Or maybe it will just be that trends accelerate slightly above what they were, or maybe things will just go back to normal. Um, all of those are possible. And anybody who tells you um, what that they know is going to happen, either ask them about where they have about, about their time machine or take it with a grain of salt. So just to finish up with, okay, well, what are people currently thinking, right? So we all have our own opinions, but what's the what collectively are people are, are people thinking? And we have some data that suggests um, that what businesses and our workers are currently thinking. And so here's something from what's called the Small Business Pulse Survey, it's done by the Census Bureau. They're, they're putting it out every week and they have state level data. And this is the data for Montana. It basically says, you know, how much time will pass before business returns to the level it was about a year ago. Um, and you know, we can see how it's changed over the weeks. And um, in Montana, we don't see as much, but nationally we have about 10% of businesses think that it's never going to get back to the 2019 level. And if you're in like restaurants, uh, you know, or, or hotels or whatever it is, that doubles to 20% of small businesses in those sectors don't think that they'll ever get back to 2019 levels. Um, 
the other groups, we've seen it brought up pretty consistent, um, you know, there hasn't been that much of an impact. It's kind of ranging the, the, it was at 20 and, you know, it's dipped down. Now it's more in the low teens. Um, but the big group is, you know, the share of people who say it's going to take more than six months. And we're seeing that kind of steadily rise, right? So businesses are at least somewhat optimistic in that 90% of Montana small businesses think that they will at some point get back to 2019 level. Uh, but pessimism is slightly increasing as more and more businesses think it's going to take more than six months for them to get back to that level. Workers on the other hand are very optimistic and I don't know where this optimism comes from, but uh, if you look at Montanans who are in the labor force or, you know, I'm going to expand it to people who are at the fringe. Um, only 4% think that they won't, it's, it's very unlikely or not at all likely that they will not have a job in three months. So if that happens, if that plays out, the unemployment rate at the end of summer in Montana will be almost exactly what it was before the crisis. Um, so Montanans are very optimistic. I will note that workers elsewhere are not as optimistic. Uh, if I look across, um, you know, a set of other regions, 11% think it's unlikely that they'll be employed. So, you know, there they're thinking that, that the unemployment rate increase, at least uh, through the end of the summer, will likely be, you know, almost three times, um, three to four times what it was prior. So, you know, there's a wide range of opinion. Uh, we don't really know what exactly what's going to happen. But the last message I want to leave you with is that we don't know. We don't know what share is going to be permanent or temporary. We don't know what's going to happen with the virus. And we don't know what's going to happen with economic policy. But it's important to remember that what happens with the virus and what happens with economic policy are not outside of our control, our collective. They're outside of our individual control to a large extent, but they are not outside of our collective control. We have control over what we choose to do with economic policy. We have control over what we do to try and contain and mitigate the damage from the virus. So um, I guess that's optimistic in that, you know, we have the ability to try and do stuff to make our own outcomes going forward better than they might otherwise be. We just have to figure out what that looks like and, and figure out how to do it. And with that, I think I'm out of time and I will take questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ward. That's some of the scariest information I've ever seen in my life. Um, <laughs> but the, You don't call the, us dismal scientists for nothing. <laughs> one of the questions um, had to do with the mask, wearing masks and, and washing hands. We're not doing that very well here. And how, do we, how can we get Montanans to do better? Um, that is a good question. Um, this is, it's a very unfortunate thing that we polarized, um, basic public health measures. Um, and now it's not just wrapped up in, do I think this is a good idea or not? It has become a symbol of partisan identity. Um, and obviously when it comes to something as basic as public health, it doesn't make sense to me that there should be any kind of partisanship here. Um, we did screw up, or at least the public health community screwed up early in the crisis when they told us that masks weren't necessary or effective. Uh, it would have been a lot easier to have this discussion had we, you know, not had that misstep. But at this point, I, you know, I mean, all we can do is try and just keep educating people that we are accumulating a very large body of evidence that suggests that masks are effective um, at reducing the odds of transmission. Um, and, um, Hopefully we can appeal to people's better natures because a lot of times when I'm wearing a mask, I'm not doing it to protect myself. I'm doing it to protect others because the biggest effect that masks have is on keeping somebody who maybe has the virus and doesn't know it from spreading it to other people. Right. And so by wearing a mask, I'm basically saying I'm concerned enough about you that even if I don't know if I have it or not, um, to on the off chance that I might have it, I'm going to wear this mask to make sure that you don't get it. And, you know, hopefully that's the, you know, a message that will break through at some point because I'd like to think that people really do care about the people that are in their community and sharing the same space with them. Another question. Diminished social capital seems to be where philanthropy and nonprofits will struggle the most too. Yes. And why can you talk about the spread between housing and food insecurity? Sure. Um, 
so yeah, so obviously, um, philanthropy is based in social capital. Um, it is, it is fundamentally about network building. It is fundamentally about, you know, so there's both sides, right? So a, a nonprofit cultivates a network of donors uh, who, you know, view that nonprofit as serving an important need and provide it with money. And then that nonprofit goes out and be becomes a trusted part of a community where people in need can look for either services or, you know, whatever it is that the nonprofits are doing. And so to the extent that people are not connecting with each other, people are not learning about those resources, either to donate to them or to access them, that's a big problem. Um, and it's one of the things that I was really concerned about at the beginning of this, that we were gonna have a whole bunch of need that was gonna be unmet because when you're isolated, it's much harder to find out what might be able to help you. Um, and I haven't seen any evidence that tips me one way or another on, on how much need is being unmet out there, but it's certainly a concern. Um, and I'm also very curious, in fact, when this paper came out this morning that showed that you know people in affluent neighborhoods are spending $1.4 billion or less per day, um, the email I shot off to one of the co-authors who I went to graduate school with was, well, does your credit card data include charitable donations? Because I'm curious how much, uh, you know, if, how much buffer people are saying, well, I have this money and I see there's lots of need. Are they trying to help fill that need by giving more money? And if so, what are they giving to? So that's, a, that's an, an open research question that, um, you know, I have posed to somebody who hopefully will go off and do it so I don't have to. Um, so um, the second question was uh, between housing and food insecurity. Yes, housing and food insecurity. So, um, so they're just different questions. Um, so food scarcity. The question in the in the in the in the household pulse survey is: um, Was there a time in the last seven days where there you didn't feel like there was enough food to eat? Um, and you know that's a very um, very specific thing and it's you know it's a relatively low bar to get over relative to do i have enough money to pay my rent or my mortgage um and so yeah i mean we we generally expect to see that food food insecurity as measured in that way because there's a broader measure which will close that gap um which actually is more forward looking because and that's the other thing so the food scarcity question if i'm remembering correctly is entirely backward looking Last week, did you not have enough food? The housing and security question is both backward looking and forward looking. It asks, were you unable to pay your rent or your mortgage last week or last month? And, or do you think that you won't be able to pay it next month? And so, you know, there's, there's also that aspect to it. Um, you know, I just view it as good news that Montana is doing a lot better on these measures than we, we see across the nation. Um, but obviously from the philanthropic community, we want those numbers to both be zero. Um, and you know, the other thing that I've struggled a little bit with, um, all of these, this survey didn't start until midway through, till basically the, the, the in mid April when it was at its worst. Um, and I really wanna know what these levels were before, uh, before this all happened. Um, so that I can see the change that's happened as a result of COVID versus just the level that was present before. And I haven't seen that done with these particular measures to my satisfaction yet, although I should probably do it myself given that I keep wanting to know the answer to that. Another question, have you seen any changes in giving levels during this time versus previous years? Let's use the example of the 2008 recession. Yeah, that's why I said I, I'd love to know the answer to that. I don't, um, you know, I said, like I said, I, I sent an email to my friend who has access to the credit card spending data because obviously a lot of credit card, uh, a lot of donations, at least modernly, are done on credit cards. So we should be able to see some of it. Otherwise, we've got to wait for longer term data to come out, uh, which usually doesn't come until we get 990s from all the nonprofits or whatever it is. Um, so I haven't seen any change. I'm curious. Like I said, you know, my expectation, my hypothesis is um, there's a lot of households who have, are spending a lot less money than they normally do. And my hope would be that they say, oh, wow, 
there's a giant crisis happening currently. Um, I'm not spending money going out to restaurants that I normally would spend. I should be taking at least some of that and putting it into my community uh, through various nonprofits. So I have a hypothesis that that's true, and thus we would probably see more giving in this crisis than the last one. Um, but I don't have any data that suggests one way or another. Well, I'll ask Marcy that question. Marcy, do you think your success with Missoula Gives is because people are not going out to restaurants, as Dr. Ward says? Yeah, I, you know, that's a, am I unmuted? I can't tell if it's Nikki or me. No, you're fine. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, our numbers doubled. We doubled what we made last year at Missoula Gives. So we made 411 last year and 811 this year. And that was with 30 less organizations. And so, um, and anecdotally, like, I think that we're seeing, you know, some of the bigger donors um, not be so impacted by this, which is, which is interesting. Cause, but I also think, I don't know. I mean, I, I also heard through Missoula Gives, you know, people were saying, oh, well, I got my $1,200 check and I'm still working and I don't really need that money. So I'm going to give back to my community. Mm -hmm. And I also think like just during this time, people really want an avenue to help their community, neighbors, friends, um, and not to be able to do something when, when they feel like they, there's not much control they have. So, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ward, I have a question for you. Uh, when you were talking about housing and food insecurity, what resources are there in Missoula for people who are facing eviction? I don't know if evictions have started again yet, but what resources are there around for renters? I am not the keeper of the catalog of list. Um, I know that there are various programs that at least were stood up earlier. I mean, I feel like the city or county had one, um, but I'm sure there are others. Um, I know United Way had its COVID fund, which was at least about helping certain sectors of workers. But I'm sure hopefully there's somebody else on the call who actually could probably list them all better than I could. Okay, thank you. Hey, Terry, this is yeah. Tylen. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, Tylen. Uh, good to see some of your faces. Um, I do, this information is probably like a month outdated. Um, but as of sometime in May, you know, the state opened their grant categories for with COVID relief money. Um, and one of their categories was um, like housing assistance, whether it's you couldn't make your rental payments or your mortgage payments. And they opened that with all the others at the end of April. And um, sometime in May, when I was talking with our advisory group, we were told that that fund had not been used at the level that the state had been expecting. So there was still quite a bit of, of funding available. And, you know, so then the question became, do, do people even know that that's a resource that like, you know, I as a renter could access? Um, and there, we discussed, you know, why that might be. And I think there was some thought that for folks who have lost their jobs, you know, there's 26 ish weeks of unemployment with the federal um, unemployment added in there. You know, and so then people are wondering, okay, four months from now, is there gonna be a real uptick in housing insecurity um, with regards to payments? But My that is something that that grant program, I believe it's still open. It's open to just individuals and families and things like that for rental and mortgage assistance. Um, yeah, and I think just more outreach about that program would be helpful in a lot of communities. And Katie Vaughn lets us know that you can find state housing resources at housing.mt.gov. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to follow up on that, like, you know, right now we've done an okay job of mitigating some of the, the biggest things that I think a lot of us were afraid of back in March. Um, but a lot of the programs that are currently providing that support will expire within the next couple of months. And so what happens after that, if they're, you know, depending on what kind of uh, fiscal policy Congress supports it with, how large it is, what, where it goes, uh, that will determine a lot of what kind of need we'll likely to see in the latter half of the year. Bryce, I'm curious if we're gonna see any impacts in the state budget from this. Like, is there gonna be some trickle down? <laughs> oh yeah, 
Yes, there will be, uh, well, again, that's, that's a fiscal policy choice, right? So, you know, one of the biggest things that a lot of economists are talking about right now is, um, uh, will a future fiscal package coming out of Congress, what kind of aid will it provide state and local governments? Because um, what, you know, it depends on the state um, and it depends on exactly how you fund your state, all that kind of stuff. But every state is expected to see very substantial declines in revenue. Um, and those declines in revenue are, will lead to pretty significant cuts, if not mitigated, um, across. And you know, obviously, it depends on what the legislatures and the governors decide to cut. But you know, in a lot of states, you're talking about you know, 15 20% cuts to revenue. So uh, that would be pretty substantial if that rippled through. And then would ripple through the rest of the economy, uh, further making it harder for us to recover. Well, I see we're about out of time. I want to thank Dr. Ward again. What a fascinating talk. Um, and repeat that our next webinar will be July 7th at noon um, with the Tamarack Grief Resource Center and Missoula Aging Services to talk about the social impacts of isolation. Thanks again, Bryce. Right, thank, thank you, everyone, for attending. Stay safe. Wash those hands. <laughs>